feel like this is the home crowd. It's very nice to be here. And riding my bike over, I was thinking about my, all the phases of my life. When I came over on Washington Street, it was my first apartment after graduating from college at the intersection of whatever this street is here and Kirkland. And it was a triple decker, and my bike was stolen from out front. And you know that story. Uh, so I'm going to talk about getting the mobility future that we want, and I'm filled, both filled with optimism and urgency. So what's interesting to me is that right now, people hate the status quo. They're willing to complain about the status quo endlessly, as you know. Complain, complain, complain. And yet, if you try to change a blessed thing, they're all like, forget it. Not going to be changing. Don't want it. I like this. And then, you know, but we know deeply that what we have isn't working. That I was surprised that Boston was called one of the most congested cities in the world, in the US. And I thought, really? And then I realized, I say that because I'm never, ever, ever in a car during peak hours, period, ever. So I, it's not an experience that I had realized. So I thought, no, things are moving for me. Um, so, so we have this moment where there's some conversations happening. And at the same time, there's this climate urgency. And so before I give any talk, I want to ground us in the moment that we are at, which is extreme urgency. And so I'm going to go full on despair for a few minutes, and then we will come out of it because there's some potentially good things. So I want to, um, I'm going to show a chart that is globally, is this year hotter or colder than the 20th century average? This was by NOAA. And if you've been born since 1980, you have never experienced a cooler than average temperature globally. And here's what 2015 looks like. Here's 2016, um, 2017, and 2018 comes out around where 2016 is. And you can see that we've already warmed the planet by about one degree centigrade. And scientists will tell us that we're going to have Using business as usual by 2100, we'll be warming it by five or six degrees centigrade. And if we did all the fantastic things that the Paris Agreement countries said they were going to do, we would still warm by three and a half degrees. And if you're like me, I can't conceive or imagine what would that look like and feel like warming a planet by three and a half or four and a half degrees. So I went and did some research, and the last time it was four and a half degrees cooler was the last ice age, where there were there were um, glaciers across all of North America and Europe. And this is a picture of ice over city skylines. And if I could reach these slides, which I can't, um, there's one of those is Boston. And so where we are standing right now was under a kilometer and a half of ice. And that was four and a half degrees cooler 20,000 years ago. So if you want to imagine what does it feel like to warm by five degrees or six or seven or three and a half, Imagine a kilometer and a half of ice to today, and we're going that amount forward. Um, so in November, the IPCC came out with its latest report, which was, what is the difference between warming by one and a half degrees or warming by two degrees? And warming by one and a half degrees versus two degrees gives us extreme heat is two and a half times worse. The coral reefs, 100% likelihood of having zero coral reefs if we go to two degrees. The fisheries on which I just, when we say fisheries, just realize the number, the size of populations, the number of countries whose economy depends on fisheries, it's two times worse going from one and a half to two degrees. And then the Arctic, um, sea Arctic free ice, we'll be seeing that every 10 years no ice in the Arctic if we go to two degrees versus every, once every 100 years. So the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is dramatic, dramatic. If we're going to achieve one and a half degrees, by 2030, 10 and a half years from now, we have to cut emissions by 50%. And if we say, when we say worldwide, cut emissions by 50%, which means that a whole bunch of countries and a whole bunch of people aren't going to do it which means many of us have to go deeper than 50%. And when you want to say to me, that's politically impossible, that can't be done, I can't believe that's going to happen, reflect on what you are saying. You are saying, I'm game with this, I'm okay. I'm willing to go down that path because this other thing is too hard. Um, 
every single waking moment for me is focused on this topic. And I'm hoping that I can get you guys to, I think actually, because you're here, you're already on this topic. But just the urgency of it, and I feel like I can't tell it to myself often enough. Like, I have to keep pushing it in. So at the same moment, we're in the middle of this incredible technology disruption. And if I think about the transport sector, it's as though there's so much disruption in transport. It's as though the tectonic plates are in motion and everything is like running lava. And so it's stressing existing business models. It's stressing existing regulations. It's stressing existing revenue streams from cities and states as well as companies. And because of all these stressors, it's provoking this reevaluation of the status quo. And for this, I am extreme optimism. Like, whoa, yes, fantastic, yahoo. So we have this moment. And I actually want to do a survey. I sometimes do this at the end of my talks, but I want to do this at the beginning of the talk, so I'm going to go back. I have a survey for you. I'm going to tell you, ask you the question, I'll put it out, and then we'll vote. So the question is, do you think existing companies and existing governments will evolve fast enough to address climate change and income inequality, or will they be too slow and the people will rise up and revolt? So over the next 10 years, do you think the future is one of evolution or one of revolution? So I want you guys to all close your eyes. It's only been with an anonymous vote. I'm looking at your eyeballs. Close them. Close, 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 close. If you think the future is going to be evolutionary, the near future, please raise your hand. Put your hands down. If you think the future is going to be revolutionary, please raise your hands. Keep those hands up, open your eyes, look around. What I see in audiences worldwide is 80 to 90% is voting revolution. And when, what's striking to me is these audiences are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, students, government policy makers, venture capitalists, people who live in cities. And so what we know is that Revolution is actually what we don't want to see because it's 30 years of climate of chaos and suffering and despair and violence. And what we really do want to see is evolution. And none of us believe we can evolve fast enough. So I want to urge you again that we need to be revolutionary evolutionists. We need to speed the pace of change in every way possible, do things that people think is unimaginable. And again, I think, whoa, what moment are we at today? When we have Trump as our president and he is demonstrating to us what was politically unimaginable and culturally unimaginable and it's imaginable. So if you think, think about that when you're thinking about how fast can we go, how fast can we press change, we need to press change as fast as we can. So I'm now get on to the other things. So what's really amazing about this technology revolution that's happening is it's made sharing really easy. And that is why I could do Zipcar, because without technology, it would have been totally impossible to rent a car by the hour. That's why we have all these transit apps, and I can now take a bus in London and know where to get off and where to get on and where to change. We can now have e-hailing, which is different from ride sharing. You could never do those things without having technology meaning smartphones, apps, GPS, electronic payment, discovery, making it possible. Um, I've been struck also by the rise of micromobility. And this slide is a, this picture is a 1910 in New York City with her little electric scooter. And what's striking about this is look in the background. That was a choice that we had at that moment. Where did we choose to go? And um, I've been paying attention to the work that's happening, the pilots that have been happening around the U.S. The, that household survey data is telling us that 50% of all car trips in the U.S. are less than three miles. And so how can we convert those miles to be done on micro, in micromobility? What's intriguing to me about the electric scooters is that people are riding them. People who have never been in a bike lane. 50% of the users in Portland and 50% of the users in Charlotte had never been on a bike or in a bike lane before and are using these vehicles. So we have this unbelievable opportunity to have this whole new class of allies to build bike lanes. So I urge you guys to recognize that they are your allies. We have now got this new group of people who want to see safe bike lanes and what can we do about them. Um, NACTO just released a report that was how many trips have been done on shared micromobility, meaning bikes and scooters. And you can see that it's doubled between 2017 and 2018. Pretty darn amazing. And what is that doubling? 
50% of it, 50% of those trips, so all of the doubling was attributed to electric motor, people going on electric bikes or electric scooters. So this is a whole new class of people, we need to embrace them, say please, 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 fantastic, you too want bike lanes, let's get going, because we can, as I say, we can transform those trips. The other part of disruption that's really giving me a lot of concern is on-demand delivery. And so right now, this you can't hardly read this chart, right now about 10% of retail in the US is um, e-retail. And I want to tell you a story that I've been telling people and we're right next door. Whatever this street is that curls between Cambridge and Boston and some real, I don't know the name of that street. I was riding my bike on it. And so it's back to back with Market Basket. I saw a delivery of toilet paper from Amazon on someone's stoop on that street. Half a block, you don't have to cross any streets to go buy it by yourself. So what is this doing to the consequences for retail in cities and the consequences for what it means for street and curb use are enormous. And this was from FedEx just um, two days ago. FedEx said e-commerce is expected to double by 2026 to 100 million packages a day. So while we're out lobbying for what's going to happen at the curb and our safety on bicycles and multimodality, recognize what this is doing to our cities. Um, I'm going to show a video. So if we think about retail today, you have the main street and you're a blue shop and a blue shop owner and you want to be on that, mail on that main street and so you have each, you know, you put your store on that main street and it's very high rent. If you don't have that kind of rent, you'll buy a, you'll rent a shop that's farther, not on the main, not on the main spot. And if you're Amazon or someone who's doing delivery or Walmart, you have the suburban warehouse. With the advent of self-driving cars in the same economic tax rule system that we have today, we'll be having what I think of as rats, retail autonomous trips. And all of those stores will find it economic to move into the streets. So our streets will be filled with inventories and warehouses that are just going straight to the customer and not having stores because it's cheaper. It's cheaper than paying for rent. And if you think that this is not perhaps true, this is from the Boston Globe last fall that was saying that Stop and Shop was going to be driving, was going to be piloting autonomous food stores, food vehicles, warehouse on our streets. So it's really obvious that this is what's going to happen. And if I think about this, I think of this as like welcome to hell. So rats in cities, we don't like rats in cities, but I will admit that, you know, rats in the countryside could be okay. So whenever you're thinking about autonomous vehicle policy, it really, density really does matter because it's how much space do you have on the streets and what are people's options. But I do feel like in cities around the world, people really need to start thinking about and evaluating what they think about rats because we're already, and we're seeing the beginning of it with on-demand delivery. So on-demand delivery is just the first step of what we can imagine everything being like. And so do we not want to have any stores left in cities? So if I think about the things that have gone wrong in transportation, I would say most of them stem from underpricing. And autonomous vehicles so are, are going to, because they're free of this cost of, of my personal time or drivers are going to magnify every single one of those problems. And so those problems would be, you don't like air pollution, we're going to see more of it. You don't like congestion, we'll see more of it. You don't like double parking or the curb being occupied by vehicles, you will see more of it. Because all of those things are now, as my little video showed, it's going to be really, really cheap. So I don't want to, I just want to, so um, two years ago, I convened 10 of the world's largest city and transport nonprofits, and we came up with this statement as a, this is what cities and transport, how they intersect. So sustainable, inclusive, prosperous, resilient cities depend on transportation that facilitates the safe, efficient, pollution-free flow of goods and people, providing affordable, healthy, and integrated mobility for all. And this is kind of, I'd say, motherhood and apple pie. These, this is the top line of the shared mobility principles. These are the nine NGOs that signed, that built this. And here are these principles. I just want to go through a few of them. And I would urge you as a coalition to sign on. We so far had 100, 200 
um, big and small firms from around the world who have signed on and endorsed these principles. And the idea is to bring city governments, people who live in cities, and the private sector together uh, with the same goal of these of a healthy, multimodal city and the same value system. And so that's the goal behind this. That it gives us a basis to argue and talk with these cities. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. So what if we made efficient use of lanes, vehicles, and curbs? And that's um, principle number three. And here's this famous, I'm hoping you've seen this before. Um, this is Seattle. And here's 200 people and 177 cars, and I'm a transportation engineer, and I say, oh my god, I've already taken off the on-street parking. We've got to put a double deck on top of that to move that traffic. It's so congested, and here's what it really looks like. So statistically, 75% of those cars only have one person, and there's the remainder. So just think about that when you're driving on the expressway, when you're stuck in our terrible congestion in Boston. This is what it really is looking like. Um, so another example, move people, not cars, and efficient use of space and assets. This is San Francisco Market Street. It used to be six lanes of all car only. Um, about five years ago, they switched it out. So the middle two lanes are transit only, and they move 60 people per lane block. Then they have the bike lane, where they move 40 people per lane block. And then they have the car lane. that used to be all the lanes, where you're only moving 12 people per lane block. Um, what if we had fair user fees across all modes? This is principle number seven. This is my top favorite one. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you guys, we all should be using it. So if walking costs you a dollar, society pays a penny. If biking costs you a dollar, society pays eight cents. If busing costs a dollar, society pays a dollar fifty. If driving costs a dollar, society pays nine dollars and twenty cents. If we had true cost pricing, how differently would we all choose to travel? And if we, as policymakers and city builders, thought about the true costs and inc included all those social and, and environmental costs, I think we would build differently. So an example of this of bad pricing is in San Francisco right this second. It's a $110 fine for illegally parked cars. And I hope you guys can see the truck in the background there blocking the bike lane as it ever was. Um, and it's $500 if you illegally park a scooter. Right this second, right now. Um, another example, in Portland, Oregon, there's a 25 cents per trip fee on scooters right now. So they thought, oh, new company, venture backed, we're going to put a quarter tax on every single trip. That is the exact same as if you'd done a $5 gas tax for cars. If we don't, it, I feel like this just goes on and on. I was yelling at the city of Boston yesterday with the taxes on TNCs. So we really do need to have congestion pricing as an example of getting some fairer user fees. So coming down to the home stretch here. Um, our mobility future really is, we are at this very, this moment of real bifurcation that if the transportation disruption that's happening happens in the status quo, we get hell without question, is the, our infrastructure, our tax infrastructure, how we've divided our roads, it all, all of the underpricing that we're doing, it gives us hell. And if we want to move to heaven, which I really believe we have this incredible opportunity right now to make that happen, we have to be really, really proactive about it. So think about you guys who I'm talking to, and as I talk around the world, for all of us right now, I think there are two things, two ways that we can address this climate urgency and move the needle. And so number one is political action. And every single one of us, low to high, from your local city councilors to your state senators to your governor to national politics, we profoundly have to get them on the bandwagon and tell them, I will vote you out if you don't address climate change. And so that is a number one thing. And the second piece is start building the sustainable new economy that we need. And so I would say, how do we do that? We do that through our personal decisions and role modeling and all of you guys doing biking, yes. Through community building, which is what you're also doing. We need to have more and more people in this, thinking about this new way that we need to live. Infrastructure, so when we're doing new bike lanes, we are building the infrastructure that we need for tomorrow. And that tomorrow is really tomorrow. Like we need this tomorrow and for the next 10 years and for the next bit. Stop building highways. So what is the infrastructure that will help us build, build the future that we want? And lastly, business models. And even I'd say Aeronaut is building a local, high community, 
something, a company and a business, a business model that really does belong in the future, sustainable, joyful place that we're hoping to live. So I just want to leave you with one example. Um, this is a really famous example from Seoul, Korea. It's called the Chungcheong River Highway Project. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was a river running the middle there, and they covered it over with highways because, of course, it's congested. We need more highways. So it ended up being 16 lanes of traffic, and you can imagine how undelightful it was to live next to it. So a mayor of Seoul decided he wanted to become president of Seoul, and this became a signature project. It was really, really hard. He had a lot of fights. He succeeded. And this is what it looks like today, and I walked on it, and it's the most phenomenal thing. And the, on the two sides, they have shared transport modes. So it's walking, biking, and public transit going down the sides and taxis. And he did go on to become president on the back of this and other projects. So while it's incredibly hard, this is a better future. I want to live in the place in the bottom. I don't want to live in the place in the top. So we need to turn our city from where they are today, and I feel like we are improving. I feel like we, I really do see it every day in Cambridge and in Somerville. It definitely feels better to me than it did 10 years ago. And it feels better than, to me than it did last year. So we are definitely going the right direction. We need to do it faster, farther, and start working at higher, at all levels of our, of our political structure. That's it. I did leave time for, oh, so wait. Infrastructure is destiny. Absolutely, infrastructure is destiny. And so we have to get this transitional moment that we're at right. We can't make any mistakes now. We have to go all in. Thanks.